Hey guys, it's Vince. Today in this video, we're going to be covering a redundant topic that no matter how many times it seems I cover it in a video, I get never ending questions dealing with grounding and dealing with um, EMI RFI noise prevention. Um, so what I decided to do, and, and on top of that, I do get sometimes challenges from potential clients or people on the channel who feel that, you know, what the misinformation that's out there, and that's the only way I can say it, seems to be relative because Joe Blow built his system this way. He's not having problems, so why should I worry about it with mine? That's totally up to you. For the guys that want the truth and the guys that want to proceed forward with building in added stability in the sense that they know they have peace of mind in that they're doing it right based on the best practices illustrated, not just by me and, and disclosed by me, but also large manufacturers. Once again, I've already done a posting from Hypotherms Engineers dealing with plasma cutters, and now I'm doing one from Lincoln Electric. Again, they, uh, they actually work with uh, Torchmate. They actually manufacture that too. The document's actually dated August 12, 2013. And this is Concepts of Signal Noise Reduction, Shielding, and Grounding. Now, I don't care if you guys are running a plasma, a mill, a lathe, a router. I could care less because the principle is this. Plasma cutters, and I've discussed this many times, they are the worst culprits when it comes to trying to initiate a stable system because they are the hardest systems to really, really eliminate noise from, mainly because they are monsters when it comes to pulling amperage. I've discussed this many times. Mills and routers, they definitely have their own issues. I mean, they're, they still have spindles and they're pulling amps, but they're not pulling amps at the level of any plasma system. Plasma systems are dogs when it comes to componentry because they're not just dealing with controllers, they're also dealing with THC systems mostly, then they're dealing with computers on top of that, and water tables and all kinds of other stuff going on in the background and everything is amplified. Plus a metal table, we know that that just becomes a giant antenna. Okay, Mills and routers, same principle at a lower degree. So again, one video to cover it all, it's going to be as short as possible, and that's what I plan on doing now. However, I'm just letting you guys know I'm not going to skimp here. I'm going to cover in great detail. This article um, is actually really, really well written, this document. There's a lot of illustrations in color, which is rare. Hypotherms that I posted a while back um, from their engineers, honestly, was not in color. It's still got a lot of excellent information, but I like to go with more modern type uh, illustrations. I think it helps get the point across. And again, it makes things more interesting. So if you guys don't have the time to watch the video, I highly recommend you go. If you have to watch it after work, in your own free time, on the weekend, whatever it may be, learn this stuff. It will save you money and save you time. So let's begin. Here we go. Okay, table of contents. Uh, lots of information here. I'm just going to go over. Okay, safety first. You can see they've got about two pages on full safety. I discuss safety all the time. Just to reiterate, if you guys are not familiar with what you're doing, hire a professional, okay? With your systems, if you're not familiar with building a controller, hire a vendor, whether it be me or anybody else who is qualified, okay? As far as actually moving forward with wiring, we're dealing with, um, in, in I'll say the highest current aptitude, a plasma system, you better know what you're doing. If you make a mistake with a plasma system, you're not just getting a wimpy shock from, you know, 110. You're going to, odds are, you could easily stop your heart. So I'm just telling you now, you're dealing with a whole different entity here. Make sure you understand it. If you're not familiar with what we're working with, check out these safety, uh, actual safety illustrations as far as what they've got here and make yourself well aware of the danger involved. This is very serious and it is life-threatening. So here we go, we'll keep going. Again, another, another interesting page on safety from everything from noise, mechanical drives, hot material, I mean, you name it. Okay, concepts of signal noise reduction. One of the things I like about this manual is that it does discuss the NEC adoption by state. Those are your codes. Um, basically, this one was from 2011. Again, everybody's state is different. If you guys are in a professional environment, most of you will be mandatorily aware of these type of codes. If you guys are not, I highly recommend checking them out. Even if you're doing it in your own house, it's still good to know these codes, guys. And I know many of you are probably laughing at that, but I'm telling you now, 
if something ever happens in your house, you want to know that you've done everything in your power to wire everything appropriately. Uh, we don't want fires, God forbid, for you and your families. So again, check this out. And, and again, it is absolutely mandatory for anyone dealing in a commercial environment to review these. Regulations exist at federal, state, and local levels. So again, check them out if you're not familiar. Okay, EMI and noise overview. Okay, real simple. An antenna converts electric power into electromagnetic radio waves, or the other way around. Any wire carrying an electrical signal makes itself a broadcast antenna by sending out electromagnetic waves, and any nearby wire becomes a receiving antenna. When its location in the path of the electromagnetic waves creates a signal in the wire, if this antenna effect transfers unwanted current and voltage to the receiving wire, it is called electromagnetic interference, EMI. EMI can result in difficult cutting operations and problems with cut quality. Everybody at some point uh, will find that they may run into an issue with cut quality. Now, it doesn't always mean, of course, it's EMI. I get asked this question a lot. Cut quality can be lots of different things. Um, and that's what makes, you know, being trying to issue a, a CNC whisperer type effect virtually impossible, especially online. I just go over troubleshooting techniques that I've used in the past. Hopefully I can hit your issue on the head. That being said, the more educated you guys are in using the information I'm providing here, this will make you that much uh, faster, so to speak, at implementing proper troubleshooting techniques as you're trying to do process of elimination by yourself. So you can see here we've got EMA, EMI, excuse me, AKRFI, Noise random signals and interference from a different signal source, both functions to decrease the quality of the signal you want. Noise and EMI, also known as radio frequency interference or RFI, is present in varying amounts in all circuits. EMI has other effects such as interfering with radio reception. Um, good, good operation is achieved when the, radio, uh, when the ratio of signal noise to plus interference, SNIR, is high. In this discussion, we will focus on increasing SNIR by, by reducing EMI, but some noise will be reduced as well. Okay, so basically what we're talking about is we want to increase our signal strength. Um, and again, to increase our signal strength, you're going to cover a lot of different factors in this article. Um, again, some factors that increase EMI. In general, the following factors will increase EMI. Longer conductors sending and receiving, close proximity of sending and receiving conductors, higher energy signals on the sending conductor, higher frequency signals on the sending conductor, capacitive or inductive coupling, loose electrical connections, okay? A lot of this stuff sounds um, really logical, so to speak, but are very, very seldomly practiced, even with pro-grade manufacturers. I cannot emphasize that enough. I've seen $50,000, $60,000 systems that the engineering involved just isn't where it should be in certain, in certain degrees on certain levels as far as the system builds. So you guys becoming aware of this, like I said before in previous videos, spotting the knot will save you a lot of money and a lot of time troubleshooting. Factors that decrease EMI. In general, the following factors will decrease EMI. Shorter conductors, sending and receiving. Greater distance between sending and receiving conductors. Lower energy signals on the sending conductor. Lower frequency signals on the sending conductor. Shielding, filtering, and tight electrical connectors. Let's just focus on the bottom three. Shielding, filtering, and tight electrical con connections. I've discussed this in so many videos, it's frightening. Um, I've carried now a plethora of products so you guys can battle these unseen forces, so to speak, and really produce that bulletproof system you're after. It's absolutely mandatory on a plasma system, all cables be double shielded. It's mandatory. Um, again, they are dealing with so many different types of electrical interference in terms of amperage pulled, mainly because that plasma system, when it fires, it's pulling 30, 40 amps. Um, and those are smaller systems. I've seen them go way, way up. And again, you're dealing at such a high level of electricity that it's inevitable you're creating one hell of a plume around that system. If that EMI penetrates those signals at all and interferes, you're screwed. Double shielded cables, mandatory. Second thing, filtering. You can use line filters. I've gotten asked this many times in the past. That's totally up to you on how, how extensive you want to get with filtering. Uh, EMI filtering can be as easy as using um, EMI ferrites, which I've already disclosed in um, numerous products. But um, overall, what we're looking at here 
is a question of which products best fit your application. I don't see anyone going out there and spending a ridiculous amount of money on doing actual um, filtering unless they feel that it's absolutely necessary. Now, when we go with double shielded cable, it absolutely is. When we go with EMI ferrites, they're cheap enough that the investment is a solid investment. There are some type of filtration systems that can be hundreds if not thousands depending upon what you're dealing with. You guys have to evaluate that. I always say start at the top first, shielding, go with the filtering, and tight electrical connectors, let's be real. I've discussed this topic numerous times when it comes to actually understanding um, connectors in the sense of why I tell you guys all the time to solder. Solder your connectors when you're building any type of automation controller. It will reduce the amount of resistance created. Now, you must properly solder. If you're not familiar with soldering, don't do it or learn how to do it or pay someone to do it. Don't take a chance with your investment. I say this all the time. No matter how many times I say it, I still see clients, past clients, present clients. It doesn't matter. They'll always want to cut corners and do the quick way because soldering is labor intensive and it is a skill set. Um, but be realistic. If you have issues then, the issues are going to be directly correlated in one way or another. Remember, every crimp connector you add to your system, you're exponentially adding resistance. So, and on top of that, I've seen crimp connectors where the end user did them and they were done in, inappropriately. And then what ends up happening is they're not even effective. Then they're there and they're not there. You don't know if they're making good contact. I can't tell you how many times I've seen that happen just because it's like I always say, there's two types of people. You got people that are lazy and just don't want to do it right. Then you have the other type of people that are uninformed, uneducated, don't have the skill set to do it and will educate themselves by watching a video and then just thinking, well, I've seen, him do seen it done once so I can do it. The problem with that whole mentality is, is that something as critical as this, when you're trying to build something to support a business or even a hobby for that matter, at this price point, you're really taking a gamble because one bad crimp connector can alleviate an entire system. I mean, you, you will have problems like you would not believe. I have seen stacked crimp connectors on grounds, which is absolutely horrific because, again, you want the lowest possible resistance on your grounds. I'll say it one more time. If at all possible, always solder. Solder is the best way to go. You do not want to use crimp connectors. Um, again, if you must, or if you have to use terminal blocks, look at the applications. End user uh, products that are coming from uh, Gecko and coming from any other type of uh, CNC system, you're gonna have a terminal block used for connections. It's just inevitable, okay? But when we're talking about connecting anything with AC, anything with connections inside the system, you always want to have a soldered lead. It is the best way to go. I cannot emphasize it enough. So again, I hope this has put that to bed. If I have any more questions on it, send them to me. I'll go over more detail. But as we go through this, I think you guys will get the point even more. You can see we've got some illustrations here. I'm not going to go too much into this. Um, again, signal carrying wires can function as antennas. They just covered that. Reduce noise to increase the signal noise ratio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, what produces EMI in your shop? Um, right now, you can see we've got the federal regulations here. Uh, if you guys are doing commercial type machining, of course, any type of machine in installed in a commercial shop, you definitely are going to want to go over the federal regulations. Um, for guys doing it in their own home shop, I still think it's good knowledge to have. Whether or not you'll look at it, that's totally up to you. But this knowledge is still very, very pertinent, and it does make a lot of sense to digest them and, again, be aware of what's actually going on as far as your state and local government regulations. Um, over here, typical sources of radiated EMI. When EMI signals travel through the air from the transmitter to the receiver, the EMI is called radiated. Radiated sources in shops might include, now I hope everybody is listening closely, Plasma cutters, particularly during arc initiation, arc welders, electric motors for shop tools, compressors and venting fans, transformers and fluorescent lighting ballasts, resistance heaters, computers and their peripherals including network equipment, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, telephone equipment, cordless phones and baby monitors, appliances such as microwave ovens or televisions. Guys, that basically covers everything. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. If you plug in anything, you're going to have EMI. The question is how much EMI you're going to actually have. 
Um, again, conducted EMI, the typical sources of radiated EMI can also produce interference in sensitive equipment when EMI travels through the electrical power service connections through the power distribution panel or through the facility's wiring. 